Uh, what part of the country are, are we uh, speaking to you from? Today, I'm in Cleveland. Cleveland, Spend Ohio. at least half my time in Florida. Though. That's where we do most of everything. Well, I'm originally from Indiana, and my Ooh. wife calls Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, the armpit of the U.S. I don't, <laughs> you, I don't know how you feel about that. but I'm pretty much in agreement with that. Yes, sir. <laughs> the, uh, Cleveland's uh, not a bad place. It's just not growing. Yeah, it's a... Uh, uh, my, wife, my, wife, my wife equates it to the sun doesn't shine there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have a lot of cloudy days. I guess when you put a, a giant lake days. next to you, that's what happens. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's crazy because like it's it's just crazy the the, the dynamic of the Midwest. And uh, if you mm-hmm. ever been to the Midwest, it is a special place that you only visit once. <laughs> <laughs> that's a little rough, but I'll go with it. Okay. Okay. Which is why I'm glad you spent half your time in Florida. So I, yeah, I can I can I can understand that. See me, I grew up in Indiana outside of Chicago. So the only thing I kept with me was the phone number. Everything else is we're gone. <laughs> yep. I don't blame you. Everywhere I go in the country, I always talk to somebody who has a connection to Cleveland, and the theme is that they had left. <laughs> Being honest, <laughs> and that's how it should be if you're from the Midwest. It, it is why the Cleveland Browns fan club is the biggest in the world because they're all over the place. Because <laughs> they were in Cleveland and they went around, but they still love the Browns. You gotta love the Browns. That is that is funny, man. This is good. This is good. I always like getting that little 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 icebreaker out there because it's always a good conversation for where people are from. And the Midwest is it's the Midwest. It is. What it, it is. is. <laughs> it is. Can you tell people a little bit of your background, where you're from, so they kind of get an idea from you? We're two minutes into the episode, so let's, let's kind of let's kind of jump a little bit of what you do, how you do it, and uh, who are you trying to help? Yeah, yeah. So, well, I grew up not in Cleveland, but I grew up in Toledo, Ohio, an even more incredible town. Okay. Uh, if you know where that is, it's northeast or no, northwest Ohio. I moved to Cleveland, I don't know, in 2091, 91 it was. Um, but I, uh, I got my undergrad from the University of Toledo. Went to Cleveland, went to work for a bank, got my master's degree from Case Western Reserve. And uh, at that point, I then went to work for Deloitte as a CPA. So I spent uh, seven years there, but it was se- it was during my time at Deloitte when I decided it was time. Man, if you know anything about CPAs, we work hard, man. It's hard. It's hard. And uh, I said, man, I don't want to do this forever, you know? Actually, if, if I could share the story, I mean, it was... Go ahead. One night, about it was about three o'clock in the morning. My daughter had just been born, mm-hmm. and uh, I did her night feeding, and I, that was a really cool time because it was her and me, right? Everybody else is sleeping. I mean, you can't beat that time with your friend, brand new daughter. Hundred percent. I was. It was three o'clock in the morning, and I started thinking to myself, "Man, I love this time, but wait a minute, this is my time with my daughter. I, that's not cool. I don't want my time with my daughter to be at three a.m. I want to go to her basketball games and football games. Well, she didn't play football, but." You know, I wanted to do, I wanted to be there for her. I wanted to do all the things that you want to do with your family. I said, man, I, I, I don't see how I can do this. So working for Deloitte, you're just working way too hard. So that was when I decided I had to make a change. So I spent about a year and a half trying to figure out this real estate thing and uh, bought three properties during that time, all small deals, like less than 30 units each. And three years later, I sold them and made like half a million bucks. I was oh. like, oh my God, are you kidding me? I'm like, wait, I just made more money on the side than I did when I was to that time when I was at Deloitte. I'm like, wait a minute. You know, I, I thought I had everything right, right? I got a good job. I went to school, got good grades, did everything you were supposed to do. But it was this thing that I did on the side that actually really made me realize like it was going to make a difference in my life. So that night I came up with a plan, but I didn't know if it would really work, right? You hear more people doing this. Well, three years later, I'm like, this works. This works. There is no way I'm going back. So that started the process of me then waning myself off at that W-2 job. And uh, this is all I've done for the last 25, 26 years now. Amazing. Amazing. I am 31 years old. So (laughs) there's hope for you, man. If you're not in real estate now, you should be. No, no, I, 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 I equate, I equate to um, the experience level of people that have been through, I mean, 25 years, that's maybe two recessions at least. Maybe th- yep. three peaking one right now. Mm-hmm. You got some uh, expertise there that a lot of people may not have. And one thing I, I really I like asking people that have been in the, in the business a long time is, how do you... This show is sponsored by Hive Mind CRM. 
It is more than just a CRM. It is a real estate and business mastermind that comes with an all-in-one CRM. You can have unlimited websites and users. You can call, text, RVM, and email all in one user interface. And you can set up custom automations for any type and multiple businesses. 65% of companies start using a CRM system within the first five years of business. Once implemented, the hive mind will save you on marketing, give you more time, and make more money. One of our users had his first $100,000 month using our system in June. We want to see you automate and accelerate your business. Text us at 210-972-1842 for future meetings. And of course, to get our $1 course on how to make more than six figures on one land deal. You can schedule your free demo today at hivemindcrm.io. I know you get get better with experience by noticing when it's coming, but how do you transition like if you're doing multifamily, how do you transition through different up up and down cycles? Or- yeah. Well, first of all, it's it actually starts before you get into the recession. It starts with discipline, right? Okay. I mean, everything we do is super deliberate. So I do I do multifamily. Why don't I do office and medical and self storage? Because I can't figure out how to make people not need a place to live. Yep. Right. Like, so that's the basis. Okay. So now, what kind of multifamily should I buy? Well, I don't want to buy the really new stuff. First of all, it's super expensive. And at the time, I couldn't afford it. I don't want to buy the really, you know, the really uh, rough properties because a lot of those people don't pay their rent and they're very much affected by recessions. So I said, let's stick in the middle where most people live. So that was very deliberate. As it turns out, when recessions come and go, the top of the market gets hurt a little bit. The bottom definitely struggles. That middle ground is where most people are. And then you have the best chance of making it through that situation. So that... So that was very deliberate. Then I thought, well, wait a minute. Most businesses make money because they find a way to create value. Well, wait a minute. That just makes sense. Let's do value-add properties. Let's do value-add multifamily in growing markets because now I want to have more people want to live in an area than is available housing. That gives me good, good pricing power. And in good neighborhoods, right, in the middle of that market, that I can add value to because in this business, what I didn't understand as much early on, which I definitely understand now, was that multifamily is not like single family, right? Single family is valued based on rent or uh, sales comps in the neighborhood, stuff like that. Multifamily is valued based on its ability to generate cash flow. So I'm like, wait a minute. So now I have a business here that if I can find a way to make it generate more cash, there's a pretty good chance somebody will make me better that will pay me more for it later right? Because there's more cash. Um, So what you see me doing here is trying to mitigate every risk that I could imagine and come up with in my brain as to what would go wrong. Let's figure out ways to mitigate it and then maintaining that discipline. So now when the recession comes, I'm as shielded as I can be, right? I mean, I can't, it can't be 100% shielded, but I'm not, you know, I don't have all my tenants losing their jobs because, you know, they're living paycheck to paycheck. You you know, I've, I've, there's so many things in place that make it so that I'm minimally affected by recessions. Now, I really got a good taste of it when I, the first 10 years we spent in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. So Cleveland, we were joking about Cleveland, but I mean, we did well in Cleveland. I'm not gonna knock Cleveland for that. But, But I thought to myself, wait a minute, I get my tenants in Cleveland by stealing from the guy next door. Right. I mean, that's a brutal world sometimes. Oh, yeah. 100%. yeah. I mean, that's what happens. Yep. What if I actually worked and, and moved to a place where people want to live? So I don't have to steal the tenant from the guy next door. I just need to open the door because they're coming. And when we went to Florida 15 years ago, whew, life completely changed. Because now, see, before I got to see the demand lower than supply, Florida is the exact opposite. I'm like, my, there is no way. I'm going back to a a neighborhood or a market where demand doesn't exceed supply. You see, so all these things kind of wrap together help to really protect me from recessions. Does that make sense? Yep. I have a unique question for you that I'm curious of your answer. So I like that you can, you want to be in place, you want a place where demand is high. You can control the rents. You want to be an upcoming market because you want to increase the NOI. Mm -hmm. One of the ways that not a lot of people talk about that I think I think you'll have an interesting perspective is you can control the financing. And if you can control your debt and financing, you can oh, that's a good variable that not a lot of people think about is a variable, but it also increases your cash flow. 
It does. Well, the biggest lesson to be learned, remember you said I've been in this a long time, yeah. seen a few recessions. Well, I saw the 0809 thing happen. I literally watched it minute by minute by minute. I was glued to see I mean, I know, I feel like I know just about everything that happened. And the people in the multifamily world that got hurt then got hurt because they didn't manage their debt maturity right. Ooh. As it turned out, remember, if you think back, I don't, you know, you were you were definitely not I was thinking in, I was, about. I was, I was in high school. I mean, I was thinking about. Yeah, girls. you didn't care about the recession. <laughs> but what happened then was the regulators came in and all real estate on the bank's books was just toxic. Right. You probably heard that word. So yeah. the regulator said, you get rid of all the real estate off your balance sheet because we're going to make you write it down. All that. It, there's a lot more to it. I'm trying to pay yeah, yeah. and kind of stay at a high level. And so the banks are like, OK, when that loan matures, we're not refinancing it. But Mr. Lender, I've been with you for 20 years. The thing's cash flowing. I don't care. We want it off our balance sheet. Goodbye. Yep. But Mr. Lender, I don't have anywhere to go because no one else will refinance it. Yep. Sorry. Then turn in the keys. And that's that happened to people who weren't careful about managing their debt because they just didn't understand that that could happen. And I see people today who don't manage their debt well are in trouble right now because I've they heard- didn't manage their, their variable rate exposure is what they didn't manage. So I've already seen, and I don't know if you've heard stuff in the multifamily space already and stuff mm-hmm. in Houston. There's a big guy. He lost like $20 million in assets. I'm, everybody's heard about it at this point. but Yeah, it's in, it's, all, all sorts of media articles. Yeah, yep, yep. But I think it goes down to managing your debt, your variable debt. Yeah. So let's. I, yeah. I don't know. I don't know enough about ver- multifamily debt as a whole. Can you talk about like what the general terms people receive and why that variable debt can influence? Yeah. And how it affected that person in Houston? Possibly? Yeah. So yeah. Well, I don't know how it would have. Well, I, there's a lot of things that went wrong in Houston. Okay. I don't. I don't. And I don't know enough about it to really give it an honest. Uh-huh, yeah, I just know what I read in the newspaper, and we know we have to be careful with that. Yeah. yeah. So, so here, here's what happens to people, though, with respect to debt right now. Most of the properties that were bought in the last two, three, four years were bought using bridge loans. And why were they their bridge loans? Bridge loan is a loan that is designed to help you take the property from here to here. And they will lend you some of the money to do that. And that's fine except it's not fixed rate financing. It's kind of like a construction loan, right? So it wouldn't meet the normal debt parameters. It wouldn't meet the normal debt coverages and things like that. They're investing in the operator that says, okay, I'm going to put this money in. You put some money in, Mr. Investor, and we'll make this property good. We're going to then make you, because we're worried about interest rate exposure. Now, this is the bridge lender saying to the borrower, Yep. You need to manage that risk. So we're going to ask you to go out into the market and buy something called a rate cap. So what it's like an insurance policy is all it is. <clears throat> Here's what rates are today, Mr. Uh, borrower. And we're going to ask you to buy a rate cap that's going to make sure the rate doesn't go above this. And you have to pay for it. And usually it's either one, two or three years is what people had to buy. So people bought those rate caps and there's nothing wrong with that. That's good. That's good management. management. Here's the problem. Nobody predicted that a year, year and a half into that rate cap, the Fed was going to raise rates 500 basis points. Yep. So now we have this loan that is protect or was protected, but that rate cap is expiring. So now it becomes fully exposed to the market. So when the rate cap was holding the rate at 4%, it's now six or six and a half. And so the think about a $10 million loan and a $10 million loan, 1% is 100 grand a year. 200 grand, 250. You can see, you can see all of a sudden we're all any cash flow that property had is now going to the bank and not to your investors. And hopefully, hopefully you'd had a business plan that allowed you to raise rents enough that you could, you could pay it. But if you didn't and your business plan didn't work out, there are people out there who were in trouble because they can't, they, they got to pay an enormous amount for a rate cap now. Like to give you an example, it's like, it's, it's like insurance. The rate, the rate. It, it is. Up. It's ensuring that the. It's like puts a ceiling on the rate, right? It's the hedging. index goes up and it says, "Nope, can't go any further." And what happens is, the other party to that insurance policy pays you the extra interest expense mm. to make you whole. That's what happens. It's really, it's really kind of interesting when you think about how it functions. But that's how it functions. So you have a counterparty paying the excess interest for you. Think of it that way. 
But now when that three-year term expires, that guy's like, hey, I'm done now, man. You're on your own, brother. All right, you got to pay the interest of yourself. But the lender's like, mm -mm, you don't have enough cash flow here, so you got to buy another rate cap or you got to sell the property because you don't have enough cash flow now to pay the debt service. And that's where people are. Some people are being forced to sell. Some people are trying to buy new rate caps that are, you know, to give you an example, we had a rate cap that we paid like 36000 for. Mm -hmm. A year, year and a half later, it was worth 300000 That's a 10x on the, on the cost. So if you had a hundred thousand dollar rate cap that now cost you a million bucks, well, I mean, I don't know about you, but you got a million bucks laying around to just throw away on a rate cap. You don't. So that's what's going on right now. Now, some of those people didn't even buy rate caps. They were just, hey, let's just let it float because I don't think rates are going anywhere. Well, they were obviously very wrong. Ooh. And so those people are getting destroyed. Wow. Okay. Okay. So they have variable interest rate exposed to the market and then by the rate pack down and now they're being exposed to the market, which is not good. And it's eating up all their cash flow, which they're forced to sell. And the only equity they have is equity they put down with their private capital or investor capital. And now they're having to exit. And now a lot of people are having to exit, which increases, it increases the amount of inventory, which lowers the value and cap rates that people are buying. Well, actually, actually, the value is not going down because of excess inventory. There's very little properties on the market right now. Okay. And the reason there are is because the only people selling are the ones who need to. Okay. Here, here's why. So you've heard something called a cap rate. Yeah. So what happens when interest rates go up, right? There's two people in every deal, the lender and the equity guy. Yep. Well, both of those guys want returns on their money. Yep. Well, when one of those guys who's putting in 67% of the of the deal, they raise their interest rate, guess what? These these guys have to take some of their money and give it to the bank in order to make it work. Yep. So that means cap rates have to go up. Before you could buy at a four cap or even sometimes in the threes, now those same deals, they don't cash flow unless you're buying it at a six cap. Well, that's think about the erosion in value there. It's yep. massive. So what's happening, these people that are being forced to sell are being forced to sell at prices that all that equity that was in it is gone. Yeah. yeah. It's not worth as much. So there's there's a lot going on here, right? There's there's still it, we're still about six to nine months out from probably seeing and feeling the worst of it, but it's happening right now. That's why people that have good properties that don't have to sell, like why would you sell in that environment? No way, I'm holding on. My property is cash flowing. I'm safe. I'm protected. I'm not going to put my property in the market right now when the only people selling are the people that need to. Yeah, I think uh, with the with the cap rate erosion, that that dividends dividends on your on your pro forma <laughs> potential pro forma. You know. Yeah, yeah. Well, one thing I want to hit on too is how, and this is I guess maybe too late, but. <laughs> How, for the next recession, how do you how do you stabilize yourself to get? Is it buying that cap rate when it's is it buying that that cap rate buy down when it's cheap? Is it maybe possibly yeah. buying long, longer term debt that's not variable? Like how do you how do you solidify and preface that for the yeah. next recession? Because I know that that's a really good question. So now, so what happens when markets change? The credit markets change. So now you can get a bridge loan still, but it's a lot more expensive. Yeah. Like a lot more. You wouldn't use a bridge loan now because there's no way you'd find a deal that that made sense for. So now people are turning to Freddie and Fannie, uh, those agencies, and those are fixed rate products usually. So they're financing them differently than they were. I will tell you what we try to do. Here's what, here's what matters. Long-term debt management, you want to manage your maturity, give yourself as much flexibility as you can. Yep. And you want to manage your rate so that, you know, we're in the real estate business. We're not in the interest rate business. We're not gambling with interest rates. So yeah. try to fix your rate. And, uh, you know, we just fixed a couple of loans. And, you know, you do it and you say, okay, well, if rates go down, that's okay. I'm still okay. If rates go up, yay, I win, right? Don't, don't worry about it. Just fix it so that you can do your deal, do it right, do what you're supposed to do with your business. Just make sure that your rate is as fixed as you can make it for as long as you can make it, but still support your business plan. See, what happened is people intended to get in and out of those deals in two years, but rates skyrocketed on them. Mr. Powell raised rates in a massive amount, so they can no longer get out after two years, but their financing was set for them to get out in two to three years. 
So they weren't wrong going in. It's the market changed on them and they didn't plan for that. So we do the same thing. We just, we just protect ourselves and make sure the other, the other way that you deal with this is through really disciplined underwriting and only by deals that have really a ton of upside because yeah. then if rates go up on you, I got all a bunch of whole new cash flow more to afford that debt. And, and that's what makes it uh, possible to get through those times. So it's, been, it's being being more selective on what you actually take on. Yeah. So you're not buying it. every we had, I, talk, I just talked about this in the last episode. That every deal is for you, and you shouldn't buy every prospective opportunity that is presented. Right. Yeah, and right now what's happening, a lot of people have the, you know what FOMO is, right? Fear of missing yeah. out. There's a lot of people with FOMO, and they're kind of compromising. Now they're like, oh, I'm going to steal this deal, right? And they, they think because the seller's under a little bit of duress, they're stealing the deal, but because they're not taking care of business and underwriting properly, they're really not getting a steal. They're really not as in as good a shape as they think they are. So people just, I really encourage anybody listening, make sure you do your dot, your I's and cross your T's on your underwriting. Be, be honest with yourself about the underwriting because otherwise you're going to get yourself in trouble because sellers are doing anything they can to get out of stuff right now sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I'm really glad we talked talk about this because I think the financing is a big point too. Because what yes. what financing you can get, even right now, determines what you could buy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Fannie and Freddie are the most popular places right now for debt. Two years ago, no one used them because they're <laughs> using bridge debt. That's funny. Bridge loans. Just kind of how it goes. Yeah, just kind of how it goes. So you are an investment firm. So you're buying capital. Are you a fund or are you do syndication or what? We did. Yeah, we did syndications for a while, and Florida is pretty competitive, as you know. Yeah. And so everybody that's buying is syndicators. So, you know, we've been at this a long time. I'm like, man, I, I hate paying up to differentiate myself, right, as, a, as just another syndicator. Me, so we went out and raised a fund. So we raised, the, you know, syndicators find the deal, then go raise the money. We flipped it around. We raised the money and then go find the deal. We, you know, I knew it would be a differentiator when we did our first fund, and it was. But what I didn't understand is just how aggressive brokers would be, sellers would be, when they know they're dealing with an entity that's already raised the money. We don't have to hope and pray that we've raised the money because we already have. So it makes us a massively stronger buyer. So that's why we do the fund thing. Okay. I have some fun questions because we're in the midst of starting a fund. Oh. And how do you raise – how big is your fund right now? Yeah, the last one is about 16 and a half million bucks. This one's going to be somewhere between 10 and 15. I like that size. It works well for me. Okay, okay. So how do you raise funds and where do you find the people to raise funds? Because I know depending on what type of fund you are, you can do different types of measures. But like, how do you do it and what type of people are you generally looking for to yeah. invest in your fund? Yeah, we do a 506C fund, if you know what that is. Yep. Uh, that means that we can openly solicit. I can have this conversation that I'm having right now with you. And so I'm allowed to do that, but I can only let in accredited investors. So that's right. the drawback, but that's cool. I mean, that's okay. So that's what we do. Our fund, I already laid out our whole business plan. That's what our fund does. So what's different about a fund, if I were talking with you about investing in my fund, I don't have the building to show you. Yeah. I don't have the exact P&L and the projections to show you. It's called a blind pool fund, meaning you have vetted me as an operator. You can see what kind of deals we've done. Our, de our whole entire track record is, is available um, and, and was fully vetted by Verivest. So I had a third party look at it and you can see all we've done are value add deals for you know 25 years. So you can see what I've done with this exact same business plan. So now over time, after you talk to me and you hear me and you, you know, you do your research, you realize, okay, I think these guys are the real deal. I want to make a commitment to their fund. And so you commit to the fund. And then we, as soon as we find our first deal, uh, we'll call the capital and then you'll send in the money. We close the deal. Then we go to the next one and the next one. That's kind of how it works. Yeah. yeah. But it's a different raise process because I don't have, a pretty picture of a building, right? I can show you examples of everything we bought in the past and we're going to continue on the same plan, but I don't have one, two, three main street to show you. So you can see exactly what you're investing in. You're investing more in us and our ability to, to, to make it work. Right. Which is really what you're investing in anyway, but it's, it's just more of a, 
You know, it's hard to do it if you don't have any experience. So how long has it been since you started your first fund? I well, our first indication we did it back in 04, I think. And the oh, wow. first actual fund was probably three, four years ago, maybe something like that. I don't know. Something okay, like that. Okay. So you okay? So you, you transitioned over time into the fund. Yeah, side. I mean we've raised probably 30, 35 million bucks, something like that. I I I don't remember what the last number was. I I should know off the top of my head, but I just don't. <laughs> well, the one thing I, I've learned about funds is that it shouldn't be all on you. So you probably have a, a fundraiser, and there's different capital partners that actually do all other things in the fund that you don't actually do. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's all it's my company, so I'm involved in most everything. But yeah, we we we've got about fifty employees. 15 employees. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. No, it's, it's, it's really cool. Like I said, we're, we're venturing into the fun space. I'm learning all about, a lot, I'm learning a lot, a lot about this and regulation and raising capital and all yeah. that stuff. You have a good SEC attorney. That's my best advice. Yeah. A hundred percent, hundred percent. One thing, one thing I'll, I'll mention too, is that when you, when you get into a fund, it's more credibility on you. And I think you meant, you kind of alluded to that Yeah, because there's, there's no yeah. deal. It's, you have to have the track record, the ROI, what preferred returns you're offering, why they want to invest in you. And you have to really sell yourself on that point versus selling mm -hmm. the deal. And I think that's the big, the big difference. It is massive. And I'm, I'm, you know, it's really important to me that we're transparent. That's why we hired Veravest to, to go through our track record and figure that out. That's why, you know, on our YouTube channel, we have a whole several, well, we have a lot of videos there, but a couple of them where I just talk about exactly, here's a deal we did. Here's why we bought it. These are before and after pictures. This is what we were thinking. This is what we did. This is what it looks like. This is what we sold. Them. Take you through the whole process because you have to have visibility, right? You're asking somebody, our minimum's a hundred grand. So you're asking someone to commit a hundred grand to you. They need to understand what you do and how you do it. hundred percent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. And it's almost like it's edu you're educating the person as well because they might not have. You don't give them like A to Z on what you do, but you kind of break it down into. You give yeah. them the, you give them the C version, the F version, and the the Y version, and yeah. like, piece it together. <laughs> yeah, I mean everybody's a little different. Some people just they don't want the they don't want to know how the sausage is made. Mm -hmm. They just want to know how it tastes. But there's other people who they want to know how it's made and. And, uh, you know, you need to be prepared for both. I I'm happy to have any conversation with anybody because, you know, again, everything we do after 25 years, everything we do is so deliberate. Like there's nothing happens in our company by accident or just because it's yeah. we did it this way. Ooh, we learned a lesson. Now we do it this way. And this is why we do it this way, because we want to avoid whatever it is that could go wrong or we think could go wrong or did go wrong. Right. It's that very deliberateness. That's why. <clears throat> it does. Uh, investors can ask me any question they want. If I don't have the answer, I'll let you know. But most of the time, we have the answer because nothing happens here by accident. It's all very purposeful and intentional. Yeah. And there's there's a process for everything. There <laughs> and is. You, yes. and you have and you have, a, you have a process for everything, so you can break down that process for anybody that add, that needs to know about that individual section of that process. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, every one of our processes has a process. It's documented. Think about how airplane pilots fly airplanes. There's yeah. a reason they don't fall out of the sky. They have, they're trained. They have checklists. They have a review process, and they have redundancy. We build all those things into all of our processes because I, I, you can't when you're doing other people's money. You don't want to, you don't want to have something slip through the cracks. So I think this is alluding to maybe people that want to transition into maybe raising more money or transitioning into larger assets, you need to build in those processes as a whole to you show do. your inefficiencies and fix those inefficiencies you may have as a small business and to introduce into a larger business. Yeah. You know, what we do here is no different than any business. I mean, you're, you're, if you're going to take, you know, 20 units and then scale to 2000, you got to have processes, right? Cause I, I'm not at every property. I'm not there when people move in. I got to know that it's all happening the way it needs to happen, right? And that's called scale and that, you know, that's all part of growing a business. But as you grow, you know, you need to nail those things down. So you're dead on, man. You're, you're hitting it right on the head. <laughs> well, why, why is uh, real estate not passive income in your eyes? Yeah, so this, this one always cracks me up because everybody, you know, they buy a single or a double. And they view it as passive income, right? They think, oh, yeah, I just show up and it's mailbox money. I'm like, well, wait a minute. 
who who fixes the leak? Well, I was just over there last Saturday and I painted the unit and I well, wait a minute, what part of that message is passive? Yeah. That sounds to me like that's active. So <laughs> what I tell people is, especially with the really small stuff, there's no passive. I mean, you're active because okay, you can't even afford to pay someone else to do most of the work. You got to do it yourself. So you're definitely active. Now, as you, gr you know, as our company grows up, I'm active, right? I am not passive in anything that we do. But if you were to give me money and invest it in our fund, now you're passive. That's true passive where all you don't you don't do anything. I do all the work. You just open your well. Actually, now you open your bank account and see the ACH um, deposit in your bank account. Was, that like, passive. Please don't say sign a check. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, actually, we, we do still have a couple of we do have a couple of investors who want checks, and I make fun. I'm like, why are you doing? This? He's like, well, what else do I have to do except open the mail and and open that check and take it to the bank? I said, all right, no, nope, fair enough. We'll write you a check if that's what you want. No worries. So but I have take the fun away for them. I had a funny story. So I talked to an older investor, one of my old mentors from early on, and he said he gets a check from, he does a triple net leases, ground leases. Yeah. So he gets a check in the mail and he said he threw away his check on accident. And it was like $50,000. I hate it when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's why uh, wires are threw away my $50,000 check. Oh man, yeah, that's a, that's a <laughs> funny side story. But I think I think uh, technology has made things a lot easier. Underwriting, communication, transparency, just raising money it, it opens up the world to at your, at your fingertips. I'm sure it's a lot more easier to raise money now than it is was back then. Even not necessarily have more experience now, but it's also easier to connect and make those connections. It is, it is. But you know what? The message I want to send to people is, you know, if you're an investor, I want you to. Choose carefully who you invest with because there, there is no one looking, right? There's, there's no one that's audited most people's books. Yeah. This is, this is more, you, you just got to be careful. So just look for people with experience, with a track record, who's willing to be transparent and who put you first, right? Follow those four rules. That's really important to me because I want investors to make money because if they don't, they're not coming back and that's not good. We don't want that situation. Yeah, so I, I want them, you know, like the guy you talked about, lost all that money. Like, you, that's not cool. I, yeah, it sucks that it happened, and it sucks. I'm glad it didn't happen to me, right? But it's it's horrible that it happened because there are a bunch of people who lost money, and those people won't invest probably in our fund or maybe your fund because they had a bad experience, and it hurts the whole, you know, it hurts everybody if that happens. It hurts the ecosystem of what we do and how and it does. Yeah, what we do and how we do it because their negligence is even associated with us because we operate in the same space. That, no, that's exactly right. Yep, yep. And that's not unusual for any industry. I was sharing this with somebody this morning. It's not unusual for any industry. It's kind of in its infancy. And I know you think, well, this has been going on forever. But, you know, the Jobs Act of 2012 is really what kind of changed the game. I mean, that was only 2012. That's only 11 years ago. That's not like it was 100 years ago. This whole thing is evolving still. So I, I, I encourage sponsors to be responsible when they do their underwriting and what they promise investors. And I strongly encourage investors to follow rules because most of the time you can see this stuff, right? You can say, well, duh. Like, you know, when you look back, you're like, well, of course that happened. I mean, you know, the, you broke three of the four rules. Like I could uh, predict that that might happen. And, and uh, that's uh, my mission is kind of to educate them on that. Right. Cause that'll help keep them out of trouble. Yeah. Yeah. What is a quote that is yours or somebody else's that you resonate with? Ooh, man, there's a lot. Um, if I pick a, like a self-development quote, I would always tell and it, it kind of it's really important to me because it kind of happened to me. You, you are where you are because you are because you uh, because you put yourself there. Right. You are where you are because that's all your mind allowed you to do. Right. So if you if I never made that choice to leave Deloitte. And to go be something else, well, I'd still be a Deloitte, and I would have missed all my kids' soccer, basketball, and everything else, right? So wherever you are in your life, it's probably because you made the decision to be there, right? So make change your mind. Change that. you got to change your brain first. I know everybody says that, but I can tell you that I've personally experienced it. I, you know, I'm 58 now. I wish I would have thought the way I think now. I wish I would have thought that way when I was your age, man. I, I wish I would have because my life would have been very, very different if I would have accelerated the whole process. So 
that's the number one thing that I want, you know, to, to share with people from a self-development standpoint. Just get kind of get out of your own way, really, is what ends up happening. And if you do, you're going to kill it. I, uh, I made a tweet yesterday. It was, uh, let me find it real quick. It says, uh, what did I post it? I says, if, if I can't, I'm off the top of my head. It says, if, if you believed, if you were guaranteed success, what, what dreams would you have? I like that. I like that, man. So, and a lot of people, like, you, you think you dream smaller because you feel like you can't aspire or get to that point, but you almost have to believe that you'll get there eventually over time and distance, but you have, you have that limiting belief that sets you back and always holds you back. Yeah, no, you're dead on. I, th- I think actually some people actually, I don't, I don't know, but I think they might actually get a little scared that they, that, oh, man, I can't. That seems scary to me to be there, right? You look at a really successful person. You're like, oh, my God, I, I, that would scare the hell out of me to be there, right? And I think that for some people, that holds them back. The other pe- the other time, they just can't imagine. I mean, their life is what it is. And, it, you know, in order to make that happen, they have to kind of leave where they are. And a lot of people don't like to leave where they are. And yeah. if you know what I mean by that, right? I mean, sometimes it's just your circle of, you know, the people Thank around you. you. Sometimes it's your yeah, your bubble. Some, yeah, it just depends. You gotta, you gotta push forward and and go be around the people that you want to be, right? If you do that, but that's hard to do, man. It's, it's hard, hard to do. It, it's really hard, especially if you're the big fish in the in the pond. You're like, I'm the big fish in the pond. I'm cool. Then to go make yourself be the little fish in the pond, it's scary. You're like, mm, why do I want to do that? That they'll eat me alive, right? And they might. I don't know, but it's a scary thing to do, and I think that's why a lot of people don't do it. No, hundred percent, hundred percent. I think uh, you always got to change your environment and changing mentors. It, it pushes you to become the the better person over mm-hmm. time. And it's not it's not a uh, a fault of your mentor. It's just that you, if you grow fast, you go through a lot of mentors. Mm-hmm. You do. Yep. Yes, and choose your mentors carefully. Yeah. Choose a mentor that is where you want to be. Don't pick yep. someone who hasn't done what you want to do <laughs> they don't know how to do it either one thing i really want to hit on really quick before we end yeah. it i love i love the story of you feeding your your daughter when when she was yeah. i did the same thing that was one of my big motivations to even go into entrepreneurship was i wanted to be there for my daughter and i i did that for all of my children mm-hmm. and i was like feedings too because I'm, I'm, I'm a night owl myself so yeah oh, I, was, I, I, I took over from like 10 to 2 a.m to 10 to 2 through 3 a.m mm-hmm. and my wife yeah. took over when they wake up like at six in the morning so I understand completely, and I, I don't want. I kind of want to dive in a little bit more of the episode. And you kind of brought it back around full circle again. So I, I understand and appreciate that that mm-hmm. point of view and that little in that little that little phrase right there of being being present. With yeah, you. I mean, I was your age. Was I your age? Uh, yeah, I was about your age. Yeah, I think I was about your age when I when it happened. And you know, man, when you, I don't know how old your kids are, but when you have. A new family and you're young you're like man uh, the weight of the world is now on my shoulders it, it's a completely different thing because prior to that life was not about anybody but yourself it was all about me 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 and all of a sudden it's not about me anymore it's about them and these people really rely on me and uh, life changes a lot so yeah that 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 is a, a true story i uh, i will take my daughter to events from time to time and they're like is that the one I said, yeah, that's the one. And they're like, oh, my God, because <laughs> she's now 25 years old and, you know, out on her own and has her own job and all that. It's it's uh, it's pretty interesting. So enjoy the time while you can with these kids, because it's it's awesome when they're young. It's awesome when they're older, too. But <laughs> and with that one, where can people find you online and people invest with you? I think this has been a great episode. I, I've covered a lot. And I think uh, fatherhood is a good mission to build the life you want. And uh, where can people find you online? Yeah, kripartners.com slash invest. So kripartners.com slash invest. When you go to that page, you'll see our track record, all the videos that I talked about, all that stuff's there. So you can see exactly what we do, exactly how we do it. And then, uh, you know, hopefully you were able to reach out to me and uh, we can hop on a call and see if what we do is right for them. And if not, that's cool too. There you go. I appreciate you coming on, Ken. I I really had a great time. I I hope our listeners enjoyed the full episode here. If you like it, go like, share, subscribe, tell a friend. We'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day, guys. Bye. 
Hey guys, so the Hive Mind is launching a new program where we are, we're helping you work deals that are valued at $1 million and up. If your deal is worth 980,000, we don't wanna take a look at it. You can submit those deals to us at submitbigland.com and we'll help you comp the deals. If it's good, we'll help you close it and we'll also help you fund it and sell it. Check us out, submitbigland.com, milliondollarmastermind.com and wholesaling million dollar land deals on Facebook. Thanks guys.